I'm sure. I try fault. really hard to get it wrong every single month. Uh, we'll get you figured out. <laughs> well, we wouldn't. We wouldn't have figured you were struggling, Savan. You pulled that off very gracefully. Unless, unless I verbalize my uh, issues. Wouldn't have even known. Wouldn't have even known. <laughs> All right, everyone, it's, uh, it's 7.30, so we'll open up the meeting. Uh, attention, this will be a virtual meeting of the Marinwood CSD Board of Directors. There will not be a public location for participating in this meeting. Any interested member of the public can participate telephonically or via internet by using the web link or dial-in information printed on this agenda. Instructions on how to make a public comment during the meeting. At points in the meeting, when the meeting chair requests public comment, members of the public participating in the live meeting, either via internet or telephone, shall indicate their desire to speak. If participating via internet, please click the raise hand feature located within the Zoom application screen. If connected via telephone, please dial star nine. All public comments shall be addressed to the board of directors and limited to three minutes per speaker. The board of directors may choose to respond to comments or request staff to respond at the conclusion of the public comic comment period. Um, and this is just a reminder, um, the public comment um, is, we, we have a three minute limit for each public comment. Um, once we get to that three minute mark, I will, um, I will provide a reminder to uh, conclude comments and then um, at three minutes, 30 seconds, the comment will be um, ending. So that is just a reminder on that piece. Um, so let's um, do a roll call, if you wouldn't mind, Tiffany. Would be happy to. Board President Ruggieri. Here. Director Case. Here. Director Kilkenny. Here. Director Oyserman. I'm unmuting here. Thank you. And Director Shea. Present. Thank you. Hold on. Recording right. in progress. Sorry. So, do we need to do roll call again? No, we have the roll call. Every year, good. Okay. okay. Um, <clears throat> moving on then to the ad agenda, looking to adopt the agenda. Are there any comments from the board on the agenda. None. Any from the public? I have no hands raised, Lisa. Okay, well, then agenda is so adopted. Um, item C, resolution number 2022-04, making findings and confirming the need to continue conducting remote meetings via teleconference of the Board of Directors, Fire Commission, and Park and Recreation Commission. Um, do you hear a motion? Motion to approve as written. I'll second that. All right, any comments from the board? I'm just curious when this is going to end. <laughs> Let me get my magic eight ball out, Bill. Hold on a second. Uh, just to give a little bit of clarity. So uh, a couple things. One, this is on here just because it was suggested last month to kind of pull it from the consent calendar for a little bit of discussion if warranted. Um, two, um, it should also be known that this resolution applies to this meeting. And if it's not passed tonight, then essentially what we need to do is uh, adjourn the meeting and postpone it to a future date uh, where you'll have an in-person meeting. Um, so I think the discussion was more around, you know, moving forward past this meeting and, and months ahead, and that's for the board to have. And then uh, finally, just to clarify, this resolution applies to all three bodies that are subject to the Brown Act for public meetings. That is, you know, obviously the Board of Directors, the Park and Rec Commission, as well as the Fire Commission. The two commissions do not hold the authority to make this declaration for themselves, and it's dependent upon the board to make the de declaration for them as they are simply advisory bodies appointed by the board. 
this isn't the agenda item where we're discussing whether we want to proceed forward online or not. It's the agenda item that we have to approve to continue this meeting online. Uh, right. Well, that's your formal action, but there, you're certainly allowed to have conversation regarding uh, future meetings. Um, and, you know, as if you wanted to go back to having a live meeting, say, you know, or in-person meeting next month or so on and so forth. Uh, but this agenda, approving this allows you to keep going with this meeting and as well as the Park and Rec and the Fire Commission. Uh, I, I, it was brought up at both meetings. Uh, my consensus was that both the both of the commissions preferred to stay remote uh, remaining at this time. Um, but uh, uh, for what that's worth. I think, right. I think I would just jump in and say, while I prefer the Zoom and I think it makes it more um, approachable for anybody who wants to join us without having to, you know, drive down to the community center and, and get into that situation, especially at a time where people may still not be feeling 100%. I do find myself wishing that we could do something, I don't know, maybe it's on a semi-annual basis an annual basis, something like that, where we could, in fact, be together. Maybe it's not a like a meeting with that's agendized in this way, but maybe it would just be, you know, I, I feel like we do represent the neighborhood, and yet we're pretty, like, when we're on these boxes, we're pretty, you know, isolated from the people that we're representing. I mean, certainly we go out and see them in our daily lives, but in our kind of official capacity, I just wish... I don't know, there could be a, a, some sort of a guided question and answer, some sort of a, you know, us just getting to know people or just giving them the opportunity to get uh, to know us a little bit better as elected officials. I know. It certainly doesn't influence this meeting, um, but looking forward, I, I'd i like to stay Zoom, but think about something outside of the box. What about uh, on April 23rd when the spring art show is taking place? That will be inside. We could have maybe a table outside where we're sitting there. And if somebody wants to come up and talk to us and meet us, we could be sitting out there. Maybe not the whole four hours, just for two hours. And um, that way we get that. Is that allowed, Eric? Well, we I'll, I can follow up to a couple of things. One, no, what you're describing is not allowed um, with more than a quorum of the board. You could have one or two board members there, but if your intent is to field any level of community questions, then you have more than a quorum. You're discussing district business. That okay. becomes a Brown Act violation. Some board members in the past have set up um, to varying degrees of participation, you know, just kind of pushed it out on social media or whatever and have set up like, say, a, uh, an hour in front of Marinwood Market where they kind of take over the table out front and have a coffee or something and anybody who's interested from the neighborhood can come up and speak. Um, sometimes they've sat there for the hour. Sometimes a couple people have come up and spoke. It's really kind of hit or miss and uh, as you can surmise, probably largely dependent on what issues are currently at play that uh, impact or affect or people uh, are interested in that are uh, fall underneath the district's business. Um, but no, you cannot get together with a more than a quorum of the board with the intent of talking about district business. Um, and I think, you know, kind of also to Chris's point, the board can get together on a social because one of the things I've been thinking about is that this board doesn't hasn't had the opportunity to interact a lot together in person with the absence of live meetings. You can get together on a social occasion that wouldn't be subject to the Brown Act, but the, uh, the stipulation would be that you just, you cannot discuss district business amongst the board. Um, it would have to be more of a, on a, on a personal level. Go ahead, Bill. We could do the pancake breakfast. When's that? Four July. Yeah, I, we're I'm, trying to do something sooner, right? That's why I was like, when is that? I sooner, sooner. I was like, <laughs> music in the park starts in June. We I, could go to uh, we could go to horseshoes. You could go. Phil. Everybody's welcome. <laughs> Jamie's pouring martinis. Just don't discuss uh, district business. You and, never uh, discuss. I, I will say we've set up a table at other past events. And I think, Savon, you actually participated in one of them a few years back. Um, 
and, and again, you know, I think Savon could probably speak to this better than I could because she was at the table. But I, I don't know that in the setting of those events, there was a lot of interest per se amongst people who were attending the event to go up and talk about district business with the board. I think the most common question that they received that day was, do you know where the restroom is? Or, um, or wait, can I get the drinks here too? Or is it just the one over? Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> so, but I, but that's not to diminish it. I do think that there are opportunities and I especially think that, you know, as there are, uh, uh, discussions or decisions to be made that have, you know, impact on, uh, on the community that I think the community does appreciate opportunity to at least know that you're there and, and are willing to uh, speak and interact with them if, uh, if they so choose. So those are well, a few we, of the we, options. We could rotate through at the art show. We did that when we did a wine tasting thing. I think the art show will be better than the wine tasting thing because the minute that people realized that me and Isabel, I was standing there with Isabel, did not have any wine. There is questions about which winery they should go to next. So yeah, I, like a drink thing that I think that the art show would be if we wanted to rotate through two people sitting there to field questions, uh, that might be a good idea. Um, but I do think that it would be fun to do a more social thing or a bigger Q and a maybe outdoors, like, um, Chris suggested. Okay, I, 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 can I can I intervene for a second because I, I think we're getting a little off track as to what this topic is here, um, yeah. and I'm happy to add this as a future agenda item to be discussed by the board and kind of looking at upcoming mm -hmm. possibilities and events and uh, I you know maybe even uh, appointing various board members to go. But I don't. Uh, I think we're getting a little far ahead of ourselves on what yeah. this conversation is intended to be. I'm sorry. I'm just trying to pull it back into the topic at hand. Thank you, Eric. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. So, so okay. Comments from from the board. Any any comments from the public on item C? Uh, yeah. One second. Stephen. Uh, yes. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, I like these Zoom meetings uh, myself, and. Um, I uh, fully endorse the comments made by uh, Chris Case. I think it is important uh, to speak in a somewhat official capacity as leaders um, uh, on behalf of the district and to field questions in a format uh, that's not, not a, necessarily a casual format. Uh, many communities have an annual meeting, and I think that should be a tradition that we should start here in Marinwood. Um, and so I, I think that's fantastic. Now, with the specific resolution, I would love to see these Zoom meetings continue uh, with a couple provisos. One, that all meetings, this meeting as well as the commission meetings, are uh, we've got them on Zoom. There's no reason why they can't be recorded and um, published on our YouTube site. Um, and um, uh, while the idea of informal gatherings, I think that's always a good idea that, that you're out in the community. Um, it doesn't really, it's, it's really not a forum where you can speak as a body about the specific challenges uh, that we face and the specific um, visions that we have for the future. So this, I just think it's just such a essential part of the democratic process for you to, um, uh, to speak with the community. Um, you can agendize it. And in fact, a meeting like tonight would be the perfect meeting where you can discuss the budget, you can uh, field questions from the, the public. You can um, say, hey, this is why we're investing uh, this, what we hope to invest for the future. Um, and so this, and then, then take a vote and, and just have a, a regular meeting. Um, it would be formatted a bit different, but I think that would be a fantastic. I don't think we should think of meeting at the pancake breakfast or a wine tasting or some of these other events that um, uh, I, don't, I don't think that should necessarily be the forum to do that, that you really should do it as a, a very clean process 
um, that can articulate your vision as community leaders. Now, with regards to the Zoom meetings, let's continue. Um, I think you could set up a workstation and have people meet while uh, at the in the um, uh, meeting room. Uh, and probably not too many people would show up, but you could offer that option for people that, that don't have access. So I think this is a very simple solution and we can keep the. Thank you, Stephen. All right, any other public comment? Uh, no. Nope. All right, um, so then can we go to a vote, please? Yes. Hang on, that feels better. Okay, Board President Ruggieri. Aye. Director Case. Aye. Director Kilkenny. Aye. Director Oyserman. Aye. And Director Shea. Aye. Thanks. No motion passes. Right, moving on to item D, the consent calendar. Uh, draft minutes of regular meeting of March 8th, 2022, and bills paid numbers 6178 to 6240. Um, do we have a motion to approve? So moved. I'll second. Great, thank you. Um, any comment from the board? <clears throat> Um, I just want to, what did I, I wanted to acknowledge that, um, hold on, I noticed that, and I asked Eric about this, the pg e bill, if you guys didn't notice, um, that uh, I like the break, how do I, never mind, never mind, forget it, I'm confusing myself, never mind. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> any others? All right. Uh, any comment or questions from the public? On the consent calendar, there are no hands raised, Lisa. All right. So then can we call for a vote? For Board President Ruggieri? Aye. Director Case? Aye. Director Kilkenny? Aye. Director Oyserman? Aye. Director Shea? Aye. Thanks. All right, thank you. And then moving on to item E, public comment, open time for items not on the agenda. Yeah, one second, please. Stephen. Thank you very much, Stephen. Are there uh, any other public comments? 
Yeah, one second, please. Jason. Hey, yeah, this is my first time joining one of these meetings. So thanks, Stephen, for making me feel so welcome. Um, I just wanted to, to mention that, you know, um, love the, the fact that there's this new uh, facility being built for the maintenance and uh, there are plans for rebuilding the playground. Um, that's, that's great. But uh, the tennis courts are in, in really bad disrepair, particularly the lower courts. And I know that the upper courts receive sort of a Band-Aid um, every few years that lasts for a very short period of time. There's already significant cracks showing in the upper courts. And I was just curious what the plans were for uh, maintaining those courts. Thanks. Thank you, Jason. Um, are there any other public comments? Uh, there are not at this time. Okay. Um, would somebody be able to field Jason's question about the courts? Yeah, I'd probably defer to Luke if he wants to comment on that. Yeah. Um, uh, thanks, Lisa. I'd be happy to speak to that. Yeah. Um, thank you, Jason. Um, yes. So the tennis courts do receive um, the treatment that you mentioned that the uh, we call them courts one and two are the ones closest to Miller Creek Road. And then courts three and four, um, the ones closest to the middle school, uh, receive like a, a crack filling treatment and a, a new top coat. Um, every two to three years on a rotating basis. And so uh, we did just have the, the courts one and two um, redone this last year and courts three and four are scheduled to happen again, I believe in the uh, next year. Um, and I'll have to double check uh, this, the schedule on that. But we do have it on a cyclical basis and um, eventually with plans to um, hopefully resurface the courts when, we, when we're able to um, figure out, you know, to put that in the budget. But um, yeah, uh, so courts three and four are there are plans to address those, and um, we're we're on track on, on that on that schedule. And the courts um, are in need of, of some repair for sure, um, and and we're hopefully going to get get to that as soon as possible. But um, it's on our radar, and it, it is part of uh, it's built into our budget to to address that. And I think in I think in the next fiscal year. Thank you, Luke. Um, all right, then moving on to district matters. Um, item F, number one, um, reviewing the second draft of district operating budget for fiscal year 2022-2023. Sure, thank you, Lisa. I, uh, you know, once again, kind of gave you guys a detailed staff report. I'm not going to go through it word for word, but just wanted to point a few things out. You know, obviously some of the major updates uh, that have happened with this since you last saw the previous draft at your last meeting, um, coming in with the property tax projections, um, and I'll talk more to that in a minute, um, as well as the majority of the rec program um, projections that include all of our traditional camps, summer camps, uh, day camps, pool, aquatics, preschool, and uh, other school break camps. Um, I do want to, again, you know, kind of as we're starting to, from a participation allowance level, come out of this, uh, you know, kind of the COVID restrictions, and we're looking at, you know, kind of near pre-COVID capacities, it does present the challenge when you're trying to look at a budget compared to prior year. Uh, because again, for the last two years, we were very conservative in our projections and uh, rightfully so. And this year we're being a little less conservative and you can even see in some of the actuals that are presented where we were incredibly conservative just due to lack of information at the time and have far exceeded you know, budgeted projections, uh, both in terms of revenue and their related expenses. Um, because, you know, programs cost money to run. Um, so it just, it makes it hard when you're trying to look at something comparatively year over year and you're seeing massive increases in, in certain lines. Uh, much of that is explained, again, simply by we're beginning to ramp our program participation and registration levels back up to kind of pre-COVID era. Um, <clears throat> On the expenditure side, um, this has been updated with all the part-time and seasonal staffing models. Uh, insurance estimates have been um, 
revised and provided from our property liability and our workers comp insurance carrier which is the special district rich risk management alliance they are still estimates at this time um, but i feel that they're probably going to wind up coming in pretty close um, i don't necessarily expect us to have the final numbers on those prior to the budget approval in may but i know that sdrma is doing all that they can to get the most competitive rates and as well as um, understanding their their district partners need needs for budgeting um, and trying to get us the most accurate estimates that they can. Um, I do think at this time though, our, our budget draft process is far enough along that I do think it, re it provides a reasonable expectation of what are gonna be our final projections. That's always my goal with this uh, draft, which is leading up to the final adoption. Um, it will be refined continuously in the coming weeks. Um, uh, with again the goal of being adopted at the May meeting, but I don't expect any significant revisions uh, moving forward from here on out. Um, a few items of note that I did want to touch on um, just district wide uh, the property taxes have been analyzed and updated based on projections. They're still relatively conservative at this time. Um, that's usually been kind of my MO when it comes to projecting out taxes. Uh, we will get our April allocation disbursements uh, coming up in the next couple of weeks. So that'll give me a little bit more data to look at. The main one that fluctuates is obviously the current secured, uh, which is also the largest of the ad valorem property taxes. The rest of them tend to stay relatively stable and I don't predict any other fluctuation with that. Um, on the park department, uh, I did incorporate the grant that we've received for the play structure replacement, both on the revenue and on the expenditure side within the capital outlay. Um, I anticipate that project will be done next fiscal year. However, the deadline for that is not until December of 2023, which would be the following fiscal year. However, I think our timing and what we're looking at should have that done by June 30th of next fiscal year. So that was why I included all of the relevant information into the budget. Um, just in terms of the revenue that we're going to be receiving, as well as the total capital expenditure that includes our required match. Um, all of the salaries for the regular staff have been updated based on the recommendations that the, uh, the board seemed receptive to at the last meeting. So all of those have been incorporated into the budget. Uh, again, um, a final uh, determination on that will be made at the June meeting when you approve the annual salary schedules. Um, but they are reflected in this budget exactly as they were proposed at the last meeting. Um, and then just on the capital outlay side for the park, it does include the play structure. That's the largest chunk in there. I know this is a large number for park, but the play structure replacement project um, is at $222,440. That includes 80%, uh, which is shown in the grant revenue uh, that is being partially grant funded. Um, and then obviously the new, a new riding mower we're desperately in need of, and then a, a tree limb chipper, which is actually a carryover from this fiscal year, and then a utility vehicle replacement, which may or may not become a carryover to the next fiscal year. I think we're getting closer every day to actually needing to retire the old gator and uh, buying a new one there. So if we do purchase that, which is, which is budgeted in our current budget, it'll obviously be coming off of next year's fiscal budget for adoption. Um, on the rec side, uh, youth rec programs, the one thing I did wanna kind of bring up, um, if you look at the third one down, uh, right now, we're still kind of talking about the need for a daily after school program as it's currently done. Uh, when we started this, we had much larger enrollment and the capacity to serve at the schools was maxed out. Um, ever since kind of COVID has taken over, a lot more parents working from home. I know the schools actually have capacity and are at, on campus and then our enrollment has declined significantly do I think we're probably averaging 10 or less per day showing up. So I'm not sure that's the best use of resources. Uh, and Robin and Luke and myself are certainly talking about what that might look like if there's not a need for this program, um, what could we put in its place? And maybe that'll become more like one week or two week specialty camp offerings that they can sign up for individually or something along those lines. I don't wanna speak out of turn, but we're certainly looking at it and certainly saying that uh, I just, the community benefit, not to mention the, uh, the cost, you know, the revenue expense benefit uh, of running an after school program every day for 
10 or fewer kids doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. Um, then I also wanted to point out, uh, again, the salaries and staff updated uniforms and apparel. Uh, you'll notice a large jump in that line. Um, that is mostly because all of the staff shirts for summer used to actually come out of our staff program supplies and that didn't make a lot of sense. So we moved that expense over to uniforms and apparel because it's more accurately describes what they are. Um, the youth shirts, uh, which are purchased at the same time are still in the uh, program supplies. And then on the capital outlay side right now on the, uh, on the rec, uh, just a couple carryovers that are still in there, a few carryovers, which is one, we're just uh, anticipating the need to replace a furnace uh, in the community center, um, kind of an annual allocation for some pool deck concrete repairs that just is some uh, patching and some smoothing. And then uh, eventually we're gonna need to replace the ADA pool chair. Um, that is in there as a compliance measure, uh, but we're just kind of waiting for the one that is in existence, which we've had for quite a long time to uh, finally no longer be serviceable. Um, on the fire department side, uh, one of the big things that I did, I, I, I do want to state that uh, I did, Chief White was gracious enough to give me some of his time last week and we sat down and went through some of the items. Um, and that was great. Um, and I've met individually with two of the captains and I'm meeting with a third captain this week. So there might be some small revisions to some of that, but I don't anticipate anything there to be significant um, and maybe a capital expenditure uh, that will be presented. Um, but again, I don't, I don't foresee large things. I did increase the overtime pay line by 50%. Part of that was due to conversation last month and then just kind of looking at historicals. Um, and then also understanding, though, that our overtime pay for the last, you know, going on two years now it has been inflated due to the fact that we've had a long term injury that we haven't been able to fill with a full time replacement um, because that person is still technically an employee and we're all we only have nine employees um, and that would bring on a 10th uh, employee. Um, so hopefully that comes down, but I did increase it all the same. So you can see how that plays into the overall budget. And then finally on the volunteer fire department, it's kind of been in hiatus ever since uh, the pandemic hit. Uh, I have talked on several occasions with uh, Greg Stilson, who served as the volunteer fire chief. Uh, it just, you know, kind of what is the future of the program? What does it look like? And I know Santa Fe has helped us kind of explore maybe transitioning it into more of a formal internship with the local uh, Santa Rosa Fire Academy. Um, so more to come on that. For right now, I've left it in there um, as that line item um, just to show it and with the future of it still somewhat uncertain. Obviously, if the volunteer fire department doesn't uh, engage in the coming year, then we wouldn't be spending the money, but it's not a lot of money to begin with. So that's kind of where we're at with that. I don't know if Luke uh, or Chief White have anything else that they want to add, but uh, that's my two cents on my report. And otherwise, I'm happy to field any questions. Thanks, Eric. Um, any questions, comments? Concerns? Concerns. I, I do think that the budget looks pretty good. You know, uh, as you look at it, it is, uh, again, I feel it's going to represent a pretty reasonable expectation of what will be presented next month for final adoption. Um, and I should point out that this budget does, even as it stands, still allocates for 100000 to be uh, dedicated uh, towards the board designated reserves and another 100000 to be allocated into our OPEB trust fund. Uh, and with that, still has us. Uh, you know, coming out on top in terms of uh, any level of net operating gain this year uh, uh, to just under 400,000, which will continue to kind of replenish the general fund. Tavon? Um, thank you for being so clear and concise and pulling things out. Um, I had asked you a few things earlier and uh, thank you for confirming what I thought that they, what they were in terms of us starting to pay back the loans that we took to make sure that we had cash reserves for this, uh, the maintenance facility. Yeah, but specifically, if you, I, I don't mean to cut you off, Savon. Savon had asked about the long-term debt that is now listed under the park department. Uh, um, and I just confirmed for her that that is the, uh, uh, the, the loan that, that was put out for partial financing of the park maintenance facility. And there, not that we couldn't afford it, we just felt like we should not have 
lower cash on hand, knowing that we don't know what's going on with the pandemic. But I had a question about the streetlights, which I forgot to um, talk to you about earlier. And so I'll talk about it now as it should be with in front of everybody. Um, electricity prices are just going to keep going up. If we can't cover with the $15 that were allocated, isn't it reasonable for us to put up a special ordinance tax? Uh, yeah. I mean, I, 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 would, I would say, yes, my electricity at home went up. We can't turn off the street lights. We need them on and $15 a year doesn't cover it anymore. Like what do we need in order to cover it? Especially aren't they, trying to do another rate hike next year? And uh, well, there's a, there's a couple things to consider. So streetlights is a little bit of a fixed um, electric fee. It does go up a little bit. It's not uh, quite as subject to the fluctuations like you know, if you run your heater for a longer period of time. They're fairly predictable. The other thing to understand within the streetlights is um, several years ago, and I want to say kind of the early 2010s, when the district... Uh, upgraded all of the street lights to what are now the LED. They did that through what's known as on-bill financing, which we've been still continuing to pay off. I think we have another couple years of that. That is roughly, uh, don't quote me on this, but I want to say it's close to $600 a month uh, just for that. So when that comes off of the street light bill, that will actually in effect lower the total amount that we're paying towards PG&E for this. Uh, it is interest free, so that it was a smart move at the time, um, and eventually it will come off. Um, and you're right, the current ordinance, which has been in existence for as long as I can find, is $15, and it actually only applies to um, select parcels. Like, for instance, all of the homes in Lucas Valley Estates do not have streetlights, and is therefore are not assessed the $15 annual streetlight assessment. Um, to up it, it would be an ordinance. Uh, I can certainly do a little bit more research on it. Most of this, it's not necessarily a special assessment because it's a utility. Um, so I don't believe that it would need to go to, a, to the voters. I think it could be an ordinance that could be passed after a couple readings by the board in public meeting settings, but I'll, I can circle back with legal to find out. But yeah, to your point, Savan, yeah. um, that hasn't escaped me that we're starting to get to a point where, you know, one major repair will chew right through whatever you have left uh, based strictly on the funding allocated for streetlights and you'd be dipping into your general fund to pay for that. So my request, I mean, I, I approve of what's going on here, but my request is moving forward to look and see if it would be a voter approved, if we would need to do that. And the second being, how long do we have left to pay monthly for what we took out to make everything LED? And then I guess the third thing is, if we were going to go and do a special tax, how much of an increase would we need in order to not just cover what we currently have, but also any repair, like a little fund so that if we had a repair, or if the increases that we're all going to see coming up soon with pg and &E, I don't know if it's going to be also for districts um, and the random fees that they have, if, if we're going to need to cover that too. So, you know what I mean? I think I'm following you. Uh, okay. Let me get, dig up some info uh, okay. and most likely give me a couple meetings and I can follow up on that. No problem. I, I, I don't just think want it's to make sure that we're not, we're not caught with dipping into general funds when we should have funds that are covering this and we have so much more stuff that we would like to do as a district and lights are very important but we would want other things too like the tennis courts and the pool and trails i have jotted down your questions okay i'll be quiet now hmm. thanks yvonne any other questions comments concerned from the board all right. I don't have any questions. I just want to say thank you to Eric and, and the staff as a whole. Um, I, it's just the detail I, I really appreciate um, and being open to explaining certain things when, when, you know, people who aren't necessarily budget experts are uh, asking questions. So thank you very much. 
course. Anything from the public? Yeah, one second, please. Stephen. Yes, hi. Uh, just a quick point on the street lights. Um, I was uh, present when these uh, decisions were made, and um, uh, we did not. Uh, we we did upgrade our LEDs uh, to LEDs, but that decreased our electricity costs by ninety percent, and we didn't uh, subsequently um, lower our uh, fees that we we charge people. So. I don't know that it's going to be, if you look at the, the numbers, I don't know if that's going to be necessary. We're already saving a lot through the, the wonders of LED technology. Now, with regards to the actual um, budget, I would like to see more uh, 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 funds uh, devoted towards the open space. I, As you know, I'm a big proponent of... of uh, 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 maintaining our open space in, uh, to a greater degree. I'd like to see us build a trail. Um, and I would think that we could make a couple of investments. One is maybe an additional staff member who would specialize in open space. And also uh, to consider getting some, they call them UTEs or utility Vehicles. These are the tiny little trucks that you see all the parks departments around us use. Um, they're they're uh, really for off-road use only. They're smaller, they're maneuverable, they're lighter weight, and so it's uh, less impact on the, the landscape, um, and they would be trail capable. Um, you could get a couple of those pickup trucks. You could get a, a little backhoe uh, attachments. They're really, I mean, it really is the cutting edge of what uh, uh, landscaping departments use. And I think that's an area that we should be looking into and uh, going after. Um, there's some really cool, um, there is some really cool equipment available in that area. So. Um, that's the short thing uh, as far as, you know, the pay raises. I think it's uh, uh, assertive, um, uh, but uh, as with all budgets, this is a, an expression of your values and your dreams. And the only thing I would say is let's not just look at this as adding to last year. Let's look at it as funding the dreams for the future for the district. All right. Thank you so much, Stephen. Um, so moving on then. Hey, Lisa, you do have another comment. Oh, I do. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's all right. One second. One second. Jason. Yeah, um, just two quick things. One to just follow up on the tennis court thing, to, because I don't think I was really clear. My main concern was just that the very new resurfacing of the upper courts is not working. Uh, there are massive cracks in the upper courts. So that's just something that, that's the whole reason I raised it. It's not, not sort of what was the, uh, the schedule to be. It's, it's, that the, it's alarming how bad the, uh, the upper courts are already looking, get, that given that they've already just been resurfaced. The second thing I wanted to mention is that, uh, you know, Miller Creek itself, um, it, you know, is an ephemeral stream. And in, in the last couple of years, I'm a fisheries biologist. I've noticed that, um, you know, there are large segments of the stream that go dry and it basically results in uh, these pools, which end up being kind of um, refuge habitat for fishes uh, until once again, the rain returns. Um, I've been in touch with a professor at UC Berkeley who specializes on studying ephemeral streams, particularly in Marin County. Um, and it turns out that these ephemeral streams are really important habitat for native fishes, mainly because they're adapted to being able to handle the kinds of um, dynamics that are associated with going partially dry and the temperatures and the load um, dissolved oxygen that results uh, when these things turn into pools. So um, that's one of the reasons that Marin County has, um, you know, hosts more species of salmon than almost any of the other counties. It has up to five species. 
Um, and so, so what I was curious about was how to pursue the opportunity to uh, potentially include Miller Creek as a research site uh, that we could, we could potentially foster uh, some, some uh, interns in terms of high school students who are interested in participating in understanding the biology of the, the stream ecology and, and how it supports the food web. Um, and namely by trying to include a couple of, of um, uh, camera traps where that could be positioned at some of these, these spots and also some net sampling uh, to understand what species are there and then what, what, how they're supporting the food web in terms of uh, the, the, the terrestrial species that feed on those fish. So um, sorry, for, sorry for taking a little bit of a long-winded approach there, but I wanted to bring it to this group's attention in case it was of interest. Thank you, Jason. Um, it's a really interesting idea. Um, yeah, Lisa, can I just follow up with that? I mean, first off, okay. um, Jason, obviously, we'd be happy to, uh, you know, on a staff level, kind of continue this conversation with you uh, offline. Uh, and I think you know how to get a hold of Luke or myself. I believe we've had some communications in the past. And then uh, secondarily, just, you know, kind of noting with Miller Creek that only uh, some select portions actually run through the district property. It kind of intertweaves, uh, interwines throughout multiple pieces of uh, uh, property, some owned by the county, um, some through CSA 13, some through Silvera Ranch. Uh, but all the same, uh, you know, we, we would be limited to anything that is kind of on our property. But uh, again, certainly happy to continue this discussion offline and encourage you to reach out to us uh, and uh, let's talk. I have no doubt you have a much greater expertise on uh, the stream habitat than, than we do. And uh, we can also share with you some of the partners we've worked with uh, on some of the aspects of Miller Creek as well. Awesome. Thanks, Eric. All right, then moving um, to District Matters item two, um, looking to approve uh, resolution 2022-005, increasing the amount of the special tax for fire protection and emergency services. Do I hear a motion? And I'm happy to give a little lead in here to uh, Lisa, if that would kind of help. Um, sure. So the staff report that I put on here does apply um, to both of the two resolutions, 2205 uh, and 2022-06. Just to, as a little bit of a background, these are special assessments. Both of these were actually put on the ballot and approved by the voters of Marinwood. It needed uh, what is known as a supermajority to pass, which is greater than two thirds of the of the uh, people voting. Uh, both received that um, language within both respective ballot measures allow for an annual increase in the amount of the tax levy that is in accordance with the increase of the consumer price index that is published uh, annually by the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Um, this is an annual item. This comes up every, every year at this point in time as we have the CPI data. Uh, for this particular year, CPI did increase by 4.2%, which is actually a bit um, higher than average. Typically, it's somewhere closer to 3%. We've had some years where it's been in the ones. Um, but again, this comes on every year, and I put the numbers at the bottom of mine as to what the fiscal impact was. Uh, in terms of what you saw in the budget, these increases have, uh, have been incorporated into the draft budget as you see it. So those, it won't increase the draft budget. It'll actually decrease the draft budget without those. Um, but this, again, is a kind of a ministerial thing that was written into the ballot language, just that the board does have to take formal action stating the uh, level of the CPI increase, as well as the uh, corresponding level of the levy increase. Um, and then all of that information eventually goes to the uh, County Department of Finance and their tax division. Hey, Eric, do you know when these special assessments got approved by the voters? Yeah, the fire was in 2011. The park, uh, as it's currently written, was in 2015, both of which in November. And then every four years, they are subject to what's known as an appropriations limit, which is a much longer kind of detailed item uh, that the uh, 
they go back uh, on the ballot just so that the district can increase what is known as our appropriations limit, which is the amount of tax revenue that we are allowed to spend. Um, and that just requires a majority vote that it wouldn't actually halt the tax revenues from coming in. It just authorizes us to add this to our, uh, to our, how much we can expend. Okay. If that makes sense. Nope, but thank you. Yeah. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so uh, a motion to approve the resolution <clears throat> 2022 uh, zero 05 to increase the amount of the special tax to fire protection and emergency. Oh, wait, do we have to do it separately? No, and emergency services. Right. But I would okay. take, the two, take the two resolutions separately, yes. But okay. uh, so you're so, just on 2205. 20, 20, yeah, for 2205. That's what I said. Yep. I'll second. Thank you. Okay. Um, Can I just quickly clarify these just kind of get melted into those parts of the budget? There's not, these aren't for specific pieces well they are limited to specifically to those departments so if you yeah, no, i understand go, that but right right yeah no there's not like specific items tied to this right. this isn't like designated grant revenue this you know ultimately supports the general operations of those right. two uh, departments and their associated functions um, if you look at it on the park side, you know, total anticipated for 22-23 is uh, around $418,000 out of a uh, total expenditure budget that is set at $1.15 million. So right. it, it, it certainly doesn't, uh, you know, it covers, uh, I don't know, 40% less than. Right. Yeah, okay, you thank know, you. Re re relatively the same on the fire side as well. Okay. And you can kind of see that it's it's under the line of a special tax assessment, which is 4120610 on the budget. So you can see that um, this is specifically a line item in there and you can see where it goes. And for fire, it's 1.25 million, uh, roughly for a budget that's 2.8 million. Okay, cool. Thank you. You are welcome. All right. Any anything from the public? Uh, yeah, one second, please. I have two two comments on this one, Lisa. Thank you, Stephen. <clears throat> I've never known a board to refuse a, a tax increase, and uh, we probably need it this year. Um, as some of you know. Um, we had our inflation report out today, and uh, inflation is the official of inflation is 8.7 percent. You certainly know it if you've been to the pump recently. Um, things are getting more expensive. Um, I guess you know I, I'm really don't object to either one of these, and I'm not going to make a comment on the second uh, because. It's basically the same comment, but um, you know, I don't think we should be automatically spending more money unless we know what we're spending it for. Um, vision, vision, goals. That's what you need to 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 have to uh, intelligently spend our money. And as stewards of uh, the CSD, I, I hope that. Uh, you look at this as uh, each individual person might with their own household budget. So anyhow, that's all I have to say. Thank you, Stephen. And uh, no, the other hand has gone down, so I have no more hands raised on this uh, topic. Thank you, Eric. Thank you. Um, all right, then. We, we can call for a vote. Board President Ruggieri. Aye. Director Case. Aye. Director Kilkenny. Aye. Director Oyserman. Aye. Director Shea. Aye. Thanks. Resolution passes. Um, moving on, item three, resolution 2022-2022. 06, increasing the amount of the special tax for park, open space, and street landscape maintenance. The motion? 
I, you want to do it, Chris? I move. I move. <laughs> <laughs> do it. I'm moving. Let's do it. Let's keep it moving. <laughs> do we have a second? I'll second. second. All right. Very good. Thank you. Any, <laughs> any comments from the board? Questions? Concerns? <laughs> Nothing. All right. Anything from the public? Uh, you have no hands raised, Lisa. Okay, thank you, Eric. Let's uh, call for a vote. Board President Ruggieri. Aye. Director Case. Aye. Director Kilkenny. Aye. Director Oyserman. Aye. Director Shea. Aye. Thanks. Right. Resolution passes. Uh, moving on to um, item four, district manager report. Great. Right. Yeah, thank you. Uh, just a couple items uh, to discuss in here. Uh, just a quick update on the park maintenance facility. We did complete our uh, punch list walkthrough and all the uh, uh, items that were noted on that have, have been resolved. Um, we actually have a final walkthrough meeting scheduled for later this week. Uh, we, along with the builder, are working with the Marin County Building and Safety Division, as well as the um, DPW Land Use Division to obtain what's known as a temporary certificate of occupancy. Um, we're not necessarily looking to move into the building quite yet. Um, however, within the permit, there's other aspects of the job that are still to be completed, primarily the construction of the exterior courtyards. Um, but with the TCO, it does... Uh, help to document that the builder has fulfilled his obligations for the construction of the building itself. And then once we receive that, we'll put out the RFP for the courtyards because we don't want things kind of overlapping if they come back. However, all indications report uh, that receiving the TCO at this point should be just a formality and one more final walkthrough from the building and safety uh, department manager. Um, so that is where we are at with that building is looking great. Um, and again, uh, uh, is just at this point, go looking for the TCO and then uh, we'll be able to close off with Murray building um, who was contracted for that aspect of this project. Um, I do wanna bring attention to the firehouse. Uh, just last week, we completed some long overdue and needed uh, uh, improvements to the backup power configuration and actually we're able to add some more critical circuits um, to the backup power. As stated in here, we did purchase a much larger portable generator uh, just this fiscal year, and we're finally able to kind of get our electric vendor to come out. Um, included in that now, whenever they have to go to backup power, it will automatically generate power to um, critical circuits in the kitchen, as well as the uh, Mira emergency dispatch communication system. Um, both of which were kind of powered up via uh, extension cords running from the previous generator, just not a, a wise or smart way to do it. And then the other aspect that we added on to the critical loads for the backup power was the actual apparatus bay doors. Why these weren't included in the original backup power configuration, I'm, I'm really not sure when the building was redone many years ago but they are on there now, everything is working great. So in the event of power outages, um, within a matter of less than a minute, they can have everything, uh, all of the critical items needed back up and powered, um, which is great. They don't have to worry about manually opening the bay doors or anything like that. So that was um, pretty key. And I know the firefighters are appreciative of Sorry. that work being completed. And then uh, just wanted to touch base on a couple of things that I'm, I know Chief White will speak a little bit further so on this topic in his report but you know through our involvement um, and uh, being a part of the Marin Wildfire Prevention Authority there are some core projects that are currently happening as we speak uh, one of which is clearing vegetation alongside the Queenstone Fire Road making sure that the road remains wide enough with no obstructions to get emergency vehicles up there um, and then in May, the goats will return to their usual grazing spots. All of that is funded actually through the core funding allocation of Marin, Wood or Marin Wildfire Prevention. It doesn't impact the local funding that we receive. Um, obviously, last year, um, actually this year, we did a lot of projects that uh, 
on the local side that were actually the result of about the last two years worth of funding, um, but we were able to do some really good work. Um, similar work will continue uh, over on Grasshopper Hill, which is kind of Heatherstone in the big hill area alongside 101 with creating some shaded fuel breaks similar to what was done in Idleberry. And we're also looking to address some needs in the large meadow that kind of runs parallel to Las Galinas, just south of uh, Miller Creek Middle School over to, I believe it's Ellen Court. Um, just behind the houses, there's kind of a large open space uh, meadow on the hillside there. Um, that isn't really appropriate uh, access for goats, but we're looking at um, doing a little bit of work along the interface there as well. So those will be our local projects. Uh, more to come on that um, as those get fully flushed out, but that's, those are what will be submitted and what are actually happening as we speak. Awesome, thank you, Eric. Any comments, questions from the board? Eric, do we have any indication of when the the park staff will be moving into the maintenance facility? Yeah, um, well, so yes, to that point. I mean, once this part is done, there are certain things that can start to be moved over, uh, you know, kind of some of the non-essential things that they're using. However, with the construction of the courtyards pending and coming up, it still won't be necessarily an operable space, um, just because we don't want to impede on that construction. But I mean, if you look at, say, an RFP going out uh, designed to potentially put it in front of the board for potential approval, even as early as May, um, possibly June, um, and then you allow anywhere from 60 to 90 days from that point for the work to actually be completed, um, assuming that a vendor uh, is selected and approved, um, you'd probably be looking at completion in that time frame sometime around mid-August. Anything from the public? Uh, yeah, one second. Thank you, Stephen. Can I can I ask a question, Eric? Is sure. the contractor still coming on site, or is that just should we put like sandbags to try to hold it up? I mean, all of us are having issues. I've had two things fall yeah. down in my yard. In the last I, I can follow up on this, or Luke can. Obviously, we've had some strong winds. It's uh, I, I don't disagree with Stephen. There are some areas that do need a little extra reinforcement. In fact, Luke and I just talked about that. The fence is actually ours. We're the ones who put that up, uh, or or had a. a a fence rental company put that up surrounding just because we knew that it would last longer than the duration of this aspect of the project. Uh, it sh should be noted 
that inside the fence on the construction site, uh, it is actually uh, staked and tied off. <clears throat> so yes, it does wobble quite a bit, but it's not just relying on sandbags or weights at the bottom of this temporary fence. There are stakes pounded into the ground and it's actually secured to those stakes on the inside as well. But there are some areas um, where two connector pieces are starting to fray and those just need to be reconnected. Okay. Um, so we'll let me just add to that, if I if I may, I actually did put a call out to the to the fence company today um, and asked them if they could bring someone out to um, resecure some of the the weak spots in the fence, and they're going to get back to me. I mean, I left I left a message with somebody that they're going to get back to me and let me know if someone can come out and fortify that. Hopefully this week. But um, in the meantime, um, we've got a couple measures we can take if they're not able to do that um, on our staff side to just make sure nothing's going to fall on anybody. So I appreciate the the heads up, Stephen. But um, yeah, we are we are aware of it. Thank you, you do have a uh, another public comment on this too. All Let's right. Chris, one second. Jason? Yeah, I was just wondering when that fence is planned to come down. Uh, I'm happy to address that. Uh, was that your only question? Yes. Okay. Great. Um, in terms of the fencing that is around it, uh, our plan is actually to move the fencing in a little bit, but the fencing will remain in place while they're constructing the exterior courtyards, just because that's going to involve a lot of grading and heavy equipment. And then once that is completed, um, which is the timeline that I just referred to with Director Case, uh, all of those fences will come down and we'll be able to, our staff uh, will be able to focus on the remaining landscaping pieces. Uh, but I don't believe we're going to need the fence up for the landscape work. Um, I, so we'll be able to open it, but we will be bringing it in uh, significantly uh, once this construction is completed and uh, prior to the work happening uh, on the courtyards. So that'll widen that pathway up a little bit, uh, but it'll most likely remain, you know, well into the summer uh, until that project's completed. Awesome. All right. Thanks, Eric. Yep. Um, moving on to fire department matters. Um, item one, draft minutes of fire commission meeting of April 5th, 2022. Director Kilkenny. Uh, Kathleen was actually absent. Did not attend. Yes. Oh, okay. She's on vacation. <laughs> <so>. <laughs> Pardon me. So I have nothing to report. Okay. Yeah, I'm happy to fill in. Uh, and obviously, Chief White was there as well and can chime in. I mean, this was a relatively uh, brief meeting with the majority of conversation, just kind of looking around some of the chief officer, uh, some of the chief's report, which is actually uh, the vast majority of which is repeated in the board meeting tonight. So we can certainly uh, uh, cover that aspect of it as well. Um, the one issue that's kind of been recurring is the concern about the uh, uh, the red eucalyptus trees on Miller Creek Road between Las Galinas and Marinwood Avenue. Um, and we can speak to that uh, as part of the chief report as well. Great. Thank you, Eric. Um, any board comments on draft minutes? I have some comments, but not really on the draft minutes. So I'll wait until after. It's about the fire commission as a general and then the email that you forwarded to us, Eric. From Stephen, so yeah, I'll sure. go after. Okay. Um, okay. So, any comments from the public on the draft minutes? Uh, you have no hands raised. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, um, Chief White. Good evening, uh, directors. Good to see you again, and uh, welcome back. Director Kilkenny from vacation. I uh, just returned myself from a brief trip to New York and I uh, was surprised at the uh, news that was on the news this morning when I woke up after only being asleep for about two hours thanks to a late flight. So I hope I can uh, present fairly uh, cohesively right now given my lack of sleep. Um, I'll start with the Marin Wildfire Prevention Authority and, and that aspect of the report. The fiscal year 22-23 report is now available on the MWPA website. Uh, it's currently uh, listed as an attachment to the April 6 ATC Advisory Technical Committee uh, meeting minutes, or excuse me, agenda. And it's under action item 8A. 
those members from the ATC have met and reviewed the master list of proposals and some of the draft proposals, and they were asked to do so for accuracy. Um, what we also have just discovered over the weekend is that apparently there's more proposals than funding available. So there's going to be some tough conversations moving forward on either the scalability of some projects or whether or not some projects are going to um, be able to be um, funded. Um, and those projects are coming from the core funding, not from the local or DSpace funding. Uh, there's a, a hefty increase in the ask for some of the programs and projects such as the grants and the direct assistance program and some of the public outreach. Uh, that's just come to my attention as of today as my meeting with Quinn Gardner as she's part of the advisory technical committee. And so our upcoming meeting on the 14th will have a lot more detail about what's taking place with those different proposals and how we're gonna move forward um, in evaluating proposals and or prioritizing those proposals as well. Uh, one of the things that Ann Creelock will be working on in the interim is ensuring that she's working with members from the Ops Committee to ensure that the budgeting and the language and the typos and other things are all addressed so that uh, there's consistency among the documents and the submissions and they all look like they're um, ready for to be considered completed staff work. So more to follow on that. Um, but specifically for us, there's no less than three, three projects currently that are have been submitted for um, risk reduction in Marin Wood. And those projects, as uh, Eric stated earlier, relate to non-shaded and shaded fuel breaks in the Lucas Valley area. Uh, the goats are gonna be returning and continuing to graze in the open spaces. And then the evacuation route vegetation management that will occur along main corridors. I've reached out to um, Quinn Gardner, which I believe she has to reach out to either uh, Calvin Schrader or Mary Scramstad to get more clarification about what exactly that represents and whether that's going to involve some of the red eucalyptus as an example, or is that going to be specifically to address and cut back some canopy, or is that going to be uh, reduction in canopy along with uh, additional roadside clearance up to 10 feet or more off the shoulder of the roads. And so uh, as I look through the, the work plan, I couldn't find any specific detail, but I'm looking on my cell phone and that's obviously a limited way of trying to research the submission. So I'm uh, hoping to report more information on that at our next meeting so that you have a, a, a lot more detail about the projects and where they'll be located and what specific work is going to be done in those uh, various sites. So stay tuned for more on that. Um, our, our goal is to actually get a, a um, final product and draft work plan submitted and approved by um, May. So we're, we're working hard to try to get these things done in a relatively short period of time so we can be ready to launch as soon as the fiscal year starts with additional projects and the funding for those projects. And as I stated, there's a, a hefty increase in funding that's going to go towards public outreach and direct assistance and grants. And so with that increased amount of funding, just want to remind everyone to continue to submit for those requests uh, for grant funding because there's going to be money available and from what I understand last year there may have been well over two hundred thousand dollars that has still been rem um, left over that had not been spent from fiscal year uh, 21-22 and that's going to roll over into this current 22-23 fiscal year so um, please make yourself familiar with that and uh, consider it uh, given the, the, the various things that we can do to draw down risk in our own properties in various areas. Um, a briefly touch on COVID-19 on Tuesday, March 29th, Food and Drug Administration, as well as the Centers for Disease and Control and Prevention, all decided that the second dose of Pfizer and or Moderna were um, authorized to be released and provided to anyone 50 years and older. Yours truly went and got it immediately a week ago Friday to make sure I was protected before I traveled. And fortunately, no adverse reactions. Um, but apparently, uh, the timeline for getting an additional updated or booster shot has been reduced from six months to now four months. And that information is coming, I guess, out of studies that were done in Europe and Israel, which showed the efficacy of the vaccine starting to wane. And they figured you could start getting the booster a little bit sooner to maintain the efficacy of the vaccines instead of waiting those additional 60 days or so. Um, I had to question for the uh, pharmacist about... Uh, 
how the COVID vaccine would be administered moving forward. Would this start to become an annual vaccine as opposed to something that we're looking to do every four to six months? And her thought was that it looks like it's gonna be moving into an annual basis at some point, depending on how the variants continue to impact us. But it would be almost like any annual flu vaccine in which they're trying to craft some variation on what they think is gonna be most effective to protect the population. And so, uh, as I know, people are starting to get somewhat vaccine wary and or vaccine weary. I think there's maybe some light at the end of the tunnel here um, in the way of not looking to have to do this every quarter or every several uh, every six months or so. So more to come on that. Uh, I did hear of a new variant just recently. I don't have a name for it, but one that I had heard about prior to drafting this report was the subvariant 2A well, or BA2 rather. Um, also known or nicknamed Delta Cron, but haven't heard a lot about that. Um, and I'm assuming there's got to be a lot of um, immunity that's taken place by virtue of about two thirds of the, of the population or more having been vaccinated. And so that's why we're not hearing about this in the same manner we did um, uh, this past January and December when we were getting a, a sign significant increase in infection rates. And so more to follow on that, um, but officials, you know, just for the, the, the report, officials continue to stress that the best protection is through being vaccinated and fully boosted. Uh, I'm hearing that being vaccinated, fully boosted and or being exposed is really what's gonna provide you the additional um, protection that's not available to those who've yet to be exposed. Um, so with that, most of the folks I've seen exposed are having mild symptoms, um, not having the adverse uh, severe respiratory challenges or anything else that would point to something similar to what we experienced with the the, um, the virus in the early several first several months of the virus. Um, one last thing about the 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 vaccinations is they're no longer recommending the Johnson and Johnson as an effective vaccination. In fact, they're now referring people to move towards. Um, getting boosted with Moderna and or Pfizer, even if you had the initial doses of Johnson & Johnson. And I think Johnson & Johnson may have been designed to just be a one-time vaccination. And so as far as being able to continue boosting and using it effectively, it appears that they're not really moving in that direction or moving in the direction of more of Moderna and Pfizer. There's also some other over-the-counter medications that are coming forward that are gonna be available and are actually are being utilized in some instances already to, um, to assist people in the early stages of infection. And so more to follow on those oral, um, oral um, tablets and or gel tabs or whatever they're considered um, to help mitigate the symptoms. Civic Gas and Electric, I'm gonna, Briefly discuss uh, something I learned about this. This was a recent um, Marinwood uh, Fire Commission topic. Uh, some of the, one of the commissioners wanted to understand how undergrounding could take place in our community of PG&E lines. And I, I had mentioned my experience was that it was, it was a very challenging thing to do in the community in which I live. And in speaking to other um, uh, another town manager here in Marin County. Uh, he explained the three ways that he understood undergrounding to take place and be most effective. And I'll start with the first, which is it's the uh, Rural Project 20B. And that's uh, designed to basically say that if the city deems it a priority and has the funding and is willing to pay for it, it can be done in that manner, first and foremost. It's uh, probably going to be an expensive proposition, but it's sometimes done um, because the city deems it something that they really want to do is they're either developing new properties or looking to underground areas that they feel are a severe threat. Um, the second manner is when utility assessment districts are created. And in this case, a neighborhood gets together. And I think this is what it may have occurred in one of the recent uh, or one of the adjacent communities here recently in uh, Marinwood. So the neighborhood gets together and they pull their resources and funding and basically decided they want to underground the utilities. And in doing so, more often than not, it's not necessarily for safety reasons, it's more because it's visually more aesthetic and appealing to those who may have a panoramic view as an example and don't want to have the telephone poles and the utilities crisscrossing right in front of their view and kind of uh, devaluing the, the scenery, if you will. And so 
that's a uh, it's another way of getting it done. And then last but not least is the Rule 20A project. And this is a program that was put together by the CPUC and um, it applies to all three utility providers that exist in California. And these providers issue credits. Those credits are based on uh, the amount of income that the, a particular community generates. And often uh, communities have credits and aren't using them. And so they end up on what they call the black market being available for sale to other communities. And you can buy those, uh, or at least you once were able to buy them uh, for a percentage of what they're really valued at. For instance, 25%, you might spend 25 cents on the dollar to buy some credits and then use those credits towards a project that you wanted to have completed in your community. Um, not really clear if that really is a, a process that's a, a functional process now, but um, it's certainly something that I, I think people are sitting on credits may still have and hope that they have some value in the event they're looking to do projects in the future. And then last but not least, I had an opportunity to sit with Jen Wickham, who's the Pacific Gas and Electric uh, reps, representative uh, to the Marin County Fire Chiefs and others here. Uh, and he indicated there's roughly about three miles of undergrounding planned for the Marinwood area. Although he could not give me exact information on where that was going to be, uh, there's going to be more to follow. Apparently that three miles is part of an annual uh, 1,500 or so miles of undergrounding that the pg e is looking to accomplish throughout the state uh, for a 10,000 mile undergrounding uh, overall goal that they have over the next several years. And so given that, um, he's going to look into it and try to provide me with some more specific information about where exactly that undergrounding will take place. And as soon as he gets that to me, I'm going to in turn share it with you, of course. So more to follow on that. Um, Move on to emergency incidents. As you can see, uh, overturned tree service truck on Lucas Valley Road. Uh, I'm hearing that's probably about the second or third time we've had a, a dynamic like that with uh, individuals that are doing tree work. Um, and speaking with the crews at 58, for whatever reason, they're not really, um, those drivers aren't as aware of the, the dynamic operating those larger rigs on the, the shoulders of the, uh, the roadway there. And so given that, uh, in this particular instance, no one was injured. The vehicle was uh, turned on its side and they needed Diego's uh, tow truck service to come and, and pull them off, off the embankment. Uh, it's a very uh, dicey situation to be in because if those trucks start rolling, then you can only imagine the, um, the potential there. On March 31st, right at the end of the month, Engine 58 went on a full first alarm assignment to the airport and they were dispatched at right around eight o'clock or so um, and saw smoke showing. And anytime you hear an airport incident, it gets your, your adrenaline going because you think of aviation fuel, avgas, or you think of jet fuel or some other um, very risky uh, exposure that you might be facing in the way of what could happen in an, air, in an aircraft or an airplane hangar. Very explosive environment. You don't want to be anywhere near those fuel vapors as they're inside of a structure that's enclosed like that. Um, they rolled up on scene and, and found that fortunately it was a vehicle fire. Um, not so fortunate for the owner who was trying to do repair work on that vehicle, but apparently something in the engine compartment caught fire. And uh, as you can see from the photos, that quote unquote classic is not something that's going to be salvageable. So it's, uh, it's unfortunate. I remember that car when I was a kid. I'm calling it a classic. The guys start laughing. I said, well, it's, it's well over 25 years old now. It's about 45 years old. So it qualifies. <laughs> so uh, anyway, that being said, we have one other incident notable that um, Engine 58 responded to as part of a, a mutual aid response for Skywalker Ranch and Marin County Fire Department. Uh, there was a, a hiker who fell and injured her, I believe her ankle in the fall. And as a result, um, wasn't really able to be moved fairly easily. And uh, that being said, CHP was gracious enough to, to help transport the, the fallen injured individual down to where the ambulance was staged, not too far away, but the helicopter ride obviously was, uh, was helpful for her given her condition. And so uh, a lot of aid there between you know, our units Marin County, Skywalker Ranch, and CHP for someone who hurt their ankle. But it just goes to show when you, uh, when you need help, you're going to get it when you come here. So um, 
Last but not least, our monthly statistics. I'm very pleased to see that our, our response times have decreased substantially. We're down to five minutes, 23 seconds. And, you know, I spoke with the crews about this and said that how much I brag on how well they're doing getting out the door and their total response times. And I, I shared the story with them that I, I saw a movie years ago that was made in the 1970s where two individuals were having a fight at the, the basement of the fire station. I didn't want to encourage anything like that, obviously, but they were having a fight and the tones went off and they knew that they had an incident. And there was this quiet agreement between them that the fight is over because they knew they had a greater mission to go and get out the door quickly. So they both, you know, they were doing their knockdown drag out. They stopped, looked at each other for a moment to make sure they were both understanding the, the same thing they did. They turned and left together and continued on doing the job. And so, um, the point I always emphasize there is that getting out the door fast is what's important because if you get out the door quickly, you'll get on the scene uh, a lot faster. And so um, turnout times are what we call them. Our turnout times are excellent and our total response times are excellent. So it's just a testimony to the crews and how important they understand, or excuse me, how they understand the importance of them actually getting out and getting on scene to help make a difference. And so uh, a lot of calls this month, though, 144 plus calls, and about two, th two thirds of those calls were EMS calls. Uh, no COVID patients this month. A um, couple of fires. Uh, one was in Marinwood at 197 Marinwood Ave. Another was in a vacant lot, and uh, another one that was the size of a dumpster that was quickly extinguished. Um, and then, uh, of course, the airport fire that I told you about. So. Uh, that being said, that summarizes my report. If there are any questions, I'm available to answer them. I, don't, I can't promise I have an answer, but I'm available to answer. Well, thank you. I do have a question. Sure. <clears throat> on that great driver on Las Galinas Road who wanted to detour their truck, do we, do they get charged for that, for the tow truck and for our call? You know, that's a great question. In many instances, agencies attempt to do cost recovery, especially mm -hmm. when they know they can bill an insurance company or, or some other individual. Oftentimes it'll happen um, for individuals who are outside of the community as opposed to already being within the community that they live in. So if this company was a Marinwood based company, as an example, I don't know that we would be looking to cost recovery because they're already paying taxes and paying for services here. However, if they were, for instance, from San Rafael or from Nevada or somewhere else and had a situation occur here and we had a cost recovery policy, then it certainly would be that we could charge them for the services we provided. You know, sometimes there's uh, fuel spilled and, you know, you want to charge for the materials that you actually utilize. You want to charge for the time. You want to charge for the specialized response and or um, uh, any other debris disposal and things of that nature that you may have to, to go through. But I don't see cost recovery as something that really occurs a whole lot. Uh, it's something we explored only briefly in my previous agency about probably 15 years ago, and it didn't go so well. Um, the, the effort and the return on investment didn't seem like it was really fruitful. So I think they kind of abandoned the idea. I think we only do it on the big ones, like the fuel truck that now we have now redone the road up on Lucas Valley because it kept happening where the fuel truck or other trucks would go over that curb. So didn't we charge that company for the fuel yes. cleanup in the creek and all that? So I think when, it, when it's big, we do, but like these little small things, I don't think we do. That's an excellent point because in that instance, I think we just received reimbursement uh, probably going back, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna guesstimate four to six months ago. Thank you. Um, I have another question and Chief, I'm gonna ask it and if it's not something that's on you, then um, I will pause and let you go home and go to sleep. Um, my question is with the fire commission and I know that they're talking about the eucalyptus trees on Miller Creek and I'm wondering if we should have the fire commission taking a look at other things um, around the community, our Marin Wood properties to see if there's other things that we can do to reduce fire, kind of like 
the Marin wildfire um, that we have going on and specifically looking at the email that Eric forwarded us in terms of the firemen um, barbecue pit area and other areas that we have that people are using um, if there are other fire safety hazard things that we need to know about and try to take care of. And is this something that we want the fire commission to do or is this the not the quite the right place to be asking this? I'm just kind of putting it out there. Should, is this gonna need to be an agenda item that we talk about later? Uh, I'm, I'm certainly willing to, to, to try to provide some response to that. I will say that some of these items don't always necessarily have a um, nexus to um, the fire department per se. Um, but that being said, uh, I don't know that the fire commission would be the best agency to look into or the best commission to look into what we consider or, or deem to be potential hazards in the community. Um, I think we, we've got um, uh, fire prevention staff who should be able to come out and explore and look at some of these areas and determine whether or not there's a hazard or some area that we think needs attention. Uh, the great thing is we've got also the MWPA staff who um, certainly do an assessment on their own to try to you know, um, identify areas of risk or concern, but not all areas of risk or concern are wildfire prevention areas and I get that. And so that's why I would you know, really look at the inspection staff to come out and really take a look at those things. The fire commission can certainly weigh in and, and provide some areas where they think they'd like to see some priority or some attention provided. I just wouldn't task them with that responsibility. I'd rather be someone who recognizes potential hazards and, and things that can be done to mitigate those hazards as opposed to just the identification of those. Okay, because um, I was thinking like they could, they could kind of, because we used to do tours with the Parks and Rec Commission and suggest things to, we still do the tours and suggest things to the board. So I was thinking that the parks, that the fire commission could do a walk through various areas and say, hey, we think these things might be. And then instead of just having the MWPA come out with an overall agenda saying like, these were areas that we looked at that we identified, maybe look, start, start there. You know what I mean? Just so that, because it's a, we own we have a huge area, yes. an open space, and it's kind of hard to. No, I, I I certainly see okay. value in many eyes and many hands helping with the lift, um, if you will. And I think um, when you've got a limited number of MWPA staff who are assigned to a specific area, then you're not going to be able to catch everything. And so, to your point, if the commission or even some of the community members or some of the directors happen to become aware of a potential um, uh, concern. Those are the things that you'd like to elevate and bring them to our attention and they can be put on a spreadsheet or we can actually do a walkthrough or a site visit and make sure that, you know, those areas where that you have concerns or the commission has concerns with, we actually get eyes on it and then either look to educate or uh, remediate depending on what needs to be done. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Eric, what do you, you okay with that or? Uh, I agree with Chief White. I don't know that the fire commission is the appropriate body when it comes to that. I think that's a much more specialized skill than making general okay. observations like the uh, like the PNR commission would. Okay. Um, to be quite honest with you, uh, and I think our firefighters are actually pretty well versed in our uh, local areas and and are pretty well aware of what it is and what's out there, and probably have a better idea than uh, we are potentially giving them credit for in terms okay. of some of the, the local hazards. Okay. Just wanted to put it out there. Thank you. Um, any other comments or questions from the board? No, um, I kind of just want to add on what Savon was saying was that it's when I read that email, it was something that sparked my thought as well of why isn't this run by our fire commission versus park and rec when it just made me think like what does our fire commission do, do could they do a little bit more for us that's kind of where it came from too yeah i think i'll, I'll touch on that just briefly that's when i indicated some of these things are not necessarily in the fire department's realm that's kind of what i was referring to some of these things are actually maybe a public works or a parks and rec or a um uh, community development or some other area, but it just somehow or another because there's a um, potential for something to occur, 
it, it draws in the fire service somehow peripherally. And so um, peripherally, we, we don't mind being involved in something like this, but we can't always take the lead in an area where it comes to when we're talking about infrastructure or, you know, what decisions are going to be made about removing and or installing something. Certainly are willing to partner with anyone on any question or any, anything we can do to assist, but we're just not always the lead agency in that regard. True. And I think it was just more of a, and thank you for the information of clarification and understanding. Yeah. So, and I think it was just more of a, and thank you for the information of clarification and understanding. Anything from the public? Yeah, one second. Anything from Steven. the public? Uh, yes, uh, Chief Weber um, issued a fire warning the other day uh, uh, because of high winds, and we had another high wind today. I didn't check, but I assume that we are also today would be a high risk, uh, fire risk area where no open flame should be uh, used outdoors. Um, it's my understanding that wildfires get uh, started by illegal campfires, lightning strikes, um, and firebugs. And um, I, I actually have a question because I don't know the answer to this, is if we come across um, someone building a, an illegal fire um, or uh, evidence of a fire, who do we call? Who's, who's the agency that responds? Um, it's obviously a potential emergency because it could start a catastrophic fire. Is it the fire department that responds? Is, should we call the fire department? It's not really a, uh, something that a fire truck needs to show up for, but someone uh, with authority should be able to determine the fire risk uh, present uh, in the community. And as you know, um, we had such an event happen in um, Marinwood Park recently. So, Absolutely. Um, obviously, if there is a open flame and there's a concern that this flame is going to be um, a potential source of rapid flame spread and or destruction, then by all means, you want to contact the fire department. If we're talking about a, an enclosed area like a barbecue grill or some other um, area where it's designed for that purpose. Um, the, the fact that there are high winds, obviously you would, you know, discourage the use of, of open flame in those uh, situations, but it's on private property. There's really not a whole lot you can do about, you know, an individual's decision to cook on private property. Obviously, if it's on public property, then there's usually some form of ordinance or some other guidance that states when it's permissible or not permissible to uh, engage in those types of activities. And so uh, absent those things, now it just really becomes a question of common sense and or, um, you know, um, doing your due diligence as a, a community member who's got concerns to, you know, have the, the, the direct conversation, not confrontational, but a conversation to just educate about fire safety. There's sometimes people don't realize if it's a, um, a, a low humidity uh, high wind, high heat day, what the risk is. Sometimes people move in from areas outside the community and don't really understand the wildland urban interface concerns. And so, you know, just a general conversation may be enough to, to um, derail or curtail that type of behavior. But ultimately, if there's a real challenge um, and you see that there's recklessness or some other um, negative intent, at that point, you would want to contact the law enforcement or other officials to to kind of point out what your concern is. But I wouldn't overreact. I would just make sure I try to have a conversation first and really assess, is there a danger here or is there just a fear? There's, there's a fine line between recognizing that there's a true danger versus an over, um, overzealous approach to trying to ensure that there's fire safety at all costs. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Chief. Any other public comment? Have a all right, night. Chief, thank you. Thank you so much for your report and for answering all of the questions that were brought up tonight. You're very welcome. Have a great night. Sleep tight.
Thanks. I appreciate yeah. it. Uh, <laughs> I'll Thanks, see Steve. you guys soon. Take care. All right, moving on to park and recreation matters. Um, item one, draft minutes. Director Case. All right, so let me run through my notes here. Um, let's see. Um, the commissioners talked about um, wanting to brainstorm some potential ideas for improving open space opportunities. Um, so we talked about uh, doing that at a, a future meeting and they were definitely, you know, interested in what we could start to offer um, within reason, certainly um, in our open space areas. Um, we discussed um, the fireman's picnic area um, and after uh, a, a nice healthy conversation, I think, and some background from Luke, um, the commissioners seem to be uh, good with decommissioning the barbecue and the drinking fountain and we're open to ideas that might improve that area within reason. Um, Luke mentioned that the staff had been doing some thinking about that and just wanted to be very careful about adding things uh, in terms of, um, you know, whether it would attract more people um, because of the proximity to homes um, and did not want to make it a nuisance for homeowners in addition to adding um, any undue kind of additional responsibilities. Um, Steven joined us at that meeting um, and voiced his opinion that he was opposed to removing the barbecues and the drinking fountain because they're well utilized and um, did not at that time think they were a safety issue. I, I think he may have changed that a little bit, but Stephen, I'll let you speak to that if you would like. Um, he just really, uh, as we've heard in our meetings, um, you know, believes it's a nice spot to sit, relax and enjoy. Um, it's a really unique um, area. And he even likes the idea of seasonal porta potties out there. Um, when we started talking about the park maintenance facility project update, it's things that we have um, all heard from Eric. It was kind of an update that the park and rec got before we got it today. So that's doesn't need to be repeated. Um, the play structure replacement project, um, Eric already pointed out that, the, that there was a, a little bit of a different deadline. Um, I think you said, Eric, December of 2023 now, uh, which was definitely gives us the ability, whether we take it or not, is a different story, gives us the ability to push it out a little bit. Um, Luke mentioned that at his uh, conference, there were a lot, lots of interest by companies that wanted to bid on that project. So he felt like there was a lot of positive information that he and his staff got um, at the conference with direct relation to the play structure replacement project um, and was excited about um, you know, kind of as we start to solidify what we want and working with those companies, um, that he was excited about that. Stephen mentioned that Ashland, Oregon has a park, I believe it was called Lithia Park, that is along a creek that um, should be an inspiration for us. Um, and it was, he pointed out some really interesting things about that. Um, I think everything else that we talked about in terms of the recreation and park maintenance activity report either has already been brought up or it looks like it's gonna be brought up in Luke's report tonight. The only thing I didn't see that I thought was of note was um, that in the main hall, I can't, I don't think we got this presented to us at our last meeting, um, a new partition was uh, put into the Bill Gordon Hall um, and uh, basically replacing the old one that was becoming non-functional um, and, and Luke and his staff were really excited about that. Um, and I think that about wraps it up. Um, oh, I'm noting one thing here that um, in talking about uh, trail policy, um, Stephen, I think you mentioned something about um, uh, bike speed limits on trails when they are also heavily used pedestrian paths and that um, at some point we may wanna think about that, especially as we start to develop that trail um, potentially between Las Galinas and Marinwood Avenue. Um, let me get to the right screen here. Any questions for me on that? I, I just had a general question. Why would we would take out the water fountain? I understand the pits, but are the water fountains getting jammed and abused by kids? 
uh, our conversation that we had that night and anybody who was there, correct me if I'm wrong, was just about the fact that, um, that we potentially didn't want any water to go to waste uh, and that the water fountain seemed pretty underutilized. In fact, it turns out, it seems that maybe the water's not even running there right now. Um, okay. So, uh, but uh, I think that probably stemmed from my, my conversations about, you know, what we were planning to do out there and, and kind of reviewing the uh, facilities that we had available out there um, and, and, you know, why and do we need them. Okay. Yeah. No, I was just, I was also harking back to previous comments from the public about that sometimes the water fountains aren't, that there's not enough of them and that they're not always working. So right. I just wanted to make sure that we weren't taking away one that somebody might be depending on, on their walks. Gotcha. So that was the gotcha. only reason I said that, but yep. if it's, Perfect. if the water's yep. off, then decommissioning it seems like a reasonable thing. But at the same time, Eric, if it's a fire hazard area and we need access to water, then maybe trying to figure out how to turn it back on, like you said, might be a good idea. And fight the fire a cup at a time. Yes, fight the fire one sippy cup at a time. <laughs> um, well, to follow up on a couple things, I, uh, you know, one of the things that was discussed is there is uh, working drinking fountains just a hundred yards or so at the mini okay. park uh, right down the path and in terms of it being a fire hazard um, I, I I think that's a bit of an overstatement but if there was a fire that was in that area kind of to Kathleen's subtle point uh, they wouldn't be hooking up there they would be hooking up at the, at the nearest hydrant across the street from my house that's the only reason why I know <laughs> yeah so maybe maybe I agree just wanted to flush that out okay all right any other comments from the board? Thank you, Chris. Very thorough, thank you. That was a really comprehensive report, thank you. Please. <laughs> any, um, any, any comment from the public? Thank you. Yeah, one second, please. please. <laughs> any, um, any, any comment from the public? Yeah. Yeah, thanks for the report. That was a comprehensive uh, report. I think you represented um, that meeting accurately. Um, and I appreciate uh, the comments, although I didn't, I, I, I do agree that most uh, uh, of the commissioners who don't actually live in this direct neighborhood thought, hey, I don't see anybody in that, in that park area, you know, why, why do we have a barbecue in there? And I think if we have a picnic area, this is what I argued, is um, that people are going to have barbecues. And it, either they're going to set up a barbecue on the wooden picnic tables or on the ground, which is not a safe solution, or we have a safe barbecue area. Now, there were only two uh, barbecue grills there, and Luke mentioned that one needed repair. And I didn't really pick up on all that until about five days later. Um, and I'm sorry, I, I didn't include everybody in on this message, but I saw a woman on a very windy day trying to light a campfire on the, uh, on the big grill. And, and I, I didn't say much to her. I, I just said, hey, you know, what do you think of this area? And, you know, I, I, I just had a pleasant conversation with her. I just wanted to see what she, how, how she felt being there. And she couldn't start her, her fire. But somehow something weird happened. I, I, and I went walking my dogs. And about 20 minutes later, I came back. And I, I must have spooked her or something because she, she left. And um, I got thinking afterwards, well, maybe she was like, maybe she, who knows what her motivations were. Maybe she was a firebug. But then I looked at the grill, and the grill has huge holes in it, and the and the, the all the uh, coals would drop right down on the ground. And I immediately sent off um, a request to get that uh, that grill decommissioned immediately because it's a it's a safety hazard. And I had to write a couple times, and I'm sorry about that, Luke. But actually, I think that's a 
uh, something I shouldn't really have to make more than one comment and it gets done. And even to this day, it's it's still there. And so someone could build a fire there and create a, a, a bad situation. Um, I you did remove the good grill, though. And um, <clears throat> quite frankly, you know, let's just be fire safe. Let's be smart. Let's take care of this area. It is a resource of our park, and there's no reason to make it uh, a more unpleasant place uh, for picnickers. And um, the uh, fountain, actually, uh, Savon, that's the only working fountain because it's built to uh, not to clog. That's uh, that's the only fountain that doesn't clog. Um, I could go into that, but. Um, all they have to do is turn it on, from my understanding, and it should be turned on. And there should also be a five-gallon bucket to put out potential flames there as well as a safety Stephen, measure. Stephen, sorry to interrupt you Very here, but um, we're past the three-minute mark. And then mark, maybe some signs that say... Absolutely. Three minutes. Stephen, thank you so much, and we really appreciate your comments. But at the remember, at the remember, at the beginning of the meeting, we said it was three minutes. So thank you so much, and we can discuss it once you stop talking. May we mute? Okay. All right. Um, would is was would anybody? Um, board or staff like to address Stephen's comment? Um, Lisa, I can talk about, about that. I was going to address it in my, um, in my report, but that's coming up next. So we can, oh. we can uh, do that there. But uh, yeah, I know I agree. I agree with a lot of the conversation that we've had so far tonight. Um, and uh, staff are in the process of removing the, the barbecue grill that does have damage um, that, that Stephen mentioned. Um, it's it's something that there is actually a concrete slab underneath that grill so um coals that fall uh through the there are some holes in that grill they do fall onto um, a concrete slab they're not falling directly onto the ground um, but that being said um, we are in the process of taking that out it's a little bit of a process because it is concreted in and it's a big um, it's a hefty grill it's going to take a little bit of equipment for us to do that but um we have plans to address that actually this week and uh, so that is underway. As far as the drinking fountain, um, I don't, I don't believe it was uh, concluded that the drinking fountain should or shouldn't be officially decommissioned. Um, I don't know that we, that we officially came to a conclusion on that. In the meantime, um, staff have addressed the, the drinking fountain, whether or not it's, it's turned on or off. It sounds like it, it is, um, uh, there is there is a water source to it, but the drinking fountain itself may have some components that aren't working correctly, so they'll be addressing that. Um, it's a very old drinking fountain, and the parts are hard to find, so um, that may take us uh, a little bit of of working on that to to get that working again. But um, that's something that we haven't decided to take that out at this time. But the broken barbecue is being removed, um, hopefully this week, and I will um, be happy to update uh, everyone on that uh, once that's completed. Um, and I don't maybe know just put a sign question. on that broken one do not use broken so that we don't have any more incidents possibly happening um yeah i mean if, if we're not able to do that by tomorrow yeah well we could we could put okay. a sign up that's that's thank uh, you awesome all right thanks luke and i i saw there was another um hand raised for public comment Yeah, uh, this is Jason. I'll be really quick. Um, I was curious about the barbecues that are close to where the, the new play, playground replacement project is going to be. Um, it seems to me that the prevailing winds uh, tend to blow uh, towards the forest or, or across the creek from those barbecues. Uh, so that's not only a fire hazard, but there's also a lot of garbage that goes from the picnic area into the creek. And I just see it accumulate across, you know, over the year, and I'm not sure who deals with that. So I was just curious what, if any, there were any plans to deal with that picnic area. All right. Thanks, Jason. 
Um, I guess I can speak to that. Um, I'm not aware of a, of a, a trash accumulation due to that specific picnic area. I and mean, we do, um, you know, clean up garbage in the creek uh, frequently. But as far as a, one of our picnic areas specifically uh, causing a buildup of debris in the creek, that's that's the first I've heard of that. And it's definitely something we'll, we'll look into and make sure that's not happening. Um, as far as the fire hazard, because of the wind, um, we do just hope that our um, picnic area users will be able to take responsibility and be smart and pay attention and, and not um, open up their picnic area to, to a hazard like that. Um, so uh, as far as historically, we have not had any issues with um, uh, specific fires being started because of our picnic areas, and, uh, but it's something that we definitely would take under consideration. Thanks, Luke. Um, moving on to can I, can I actually ask a, a, a just kind of a general question about so if we were to and, and obviously there's need to be a conversation if we were to decommission like those barbecues in the fire and picnic area or the drinking fountain what's the process of that because I feel like the fire I mean excuse me the PNR commission talked about it we did not come I agree with Luke we did not come to a formal like hey let's pass this on to the board. Um, but what's, what's the process? We have to officially agendize it and then go, or can it be, you know, part of a conversation that organically grows out of something? I'm just. No, curious. I think, I think Chris, personally, the, uh, the conversation that happened at the PNR commission was appropriate and it was kind of a, a guidance and a sounding board for staff. I would, I would personally not bring an item like barbecues to the board. Uh, okay. I, that's in my opinion just simply a, a staff level and that's why you also have advisory bodies with the commissions uh, as well I, I just don't necessarily see it as the business aspect per se of the okay. district uh, and it's just it's just not something I would elevate personally to a board level okay um, all right and and just Jason in response to your question about those barbecues being a fire hazard I I I guess the way I see that as being a little different and, and obviously people may disagree with me, but I was more focused on the ones inside the forest because there's, while there is foot traffic near those barbecues, it doesn't receive nearly the amount of visual traffic that those ones by the playground get. Um, and my concern, I'm also a, a teacher at the middle school. Um, and my concern was, that whether it be people uh, illegally camping or um, students who are testing out, you know, the boundaries of life, um, I, I just see that the the real unsupervised nature of having barbecues in the middle of a forest um, different than uh, what we have next to the uh, the creek and the playground area. That's just my two cents, but I just wanted to respond since you were asking us a question. Can I ask a follow-up question? If we decide to change, and I'm not, again, I'll follow Chris's, um, so the his line on this, but not that I'm suggesting we change or bring it up like that, and I know it's not a different agenda item, but if we were to change the fireman's picnic area to something, would that be our level or would that be park and rec? And the reason why I'm asking is if I wanna give my two cents, do I need to then make sure I attend a park and rec meeting? Um, well, I guess it depends on your definition of change. I don't think that we're necessarily looking to change it in any aspect and otherwise just kind of maintain it as the quiet spot that it is. And the conversation at the point just kind of focused around, is this spot appropriate to have things like a barbecue uh, or other built-in infrastructure? And the, my uh, takeaway was the general consensus, uh, you know, pretty much unanimously from the commission was that it made sense that these items are removed and as staff, we agreed with that consensus as well. Um, but we're not looking to redesign the whole area or do anything like that. No, we're no, I, some, some minor kind of modifications. I know that I just use that as an example. Like I know the play structure because it affects the budget comes to us, but the picking of the play structure doesn't necessarily come to us that's the park and rec. So that's where I'm asking if we were to change something big, it goes to park and rec and then not necessarily us. 
Unless uh, financially. Uh, yeah, I think if you're looking at, you know, making kind of drastic things that you're also looking at a large outlay uh, financially as well, at which point those would those types of things would certainly kind of roll up to the board. And I think in terms of, you know, using the play structure as an example, that's going to actually come to the board because of the level of the contract that's going to be done okay. and the way that's being phrased as a uh, design and build. There will be various uh, design aspects to choose from. So to that point, it will, to some degree, actually be coming to the board, but you'll also certainly have the recommendation of the Park and Rec Commission, I would assume, as well. Correct. So that's what my point is, is that if it's, if it's discussed in length at the Park and Rec, and there's no financial, you know, decision to be made, then it doesn't have to be discussed in length for us. Uh, in theory, I suppose, sure. Okay, thanks. All right. All right, can we move on to recreation and park maintenance activity reports? Thanks, Lisa. Um, I'm trying not to be too long-winded on this. Um, just a couple of highlights uh, from my report, and, uh, just to update everyone on what's been going on in the park and rec world this last month. Um, the pool season opened last Monday, uh, and this is a big, uh, one of the big uh, highlights of, of the month and um, we're really excited about that. So uh, we started on Monday the 4th and have been running lap swim and recreation swim. Uh, we've had taught pool hours uh, seven days a week. We're offering swim lessons, lifeguard training classes and uh, pool party rentals. So um, this, the season's off to a good start. Um, the weather's been uh, very up and down uh, since we opened, but um, things have been going well and it's been well attended. It's been wonderful to see um, a lot of our regulars back at the pool, um, a lot of whom took off the last couple of years for um, obvious reasons. So um, things feel very normal down there and we're, we're happy to be back in action. Um, thankfully, we were able to stay open this last two years in spite of um, the complications of COVID, but um, we've returned to a more normal uh, model for how we operate and, and we're open to the, the general public and it's been uh, going well. So a big thanks to John Paul for um, getting the staff trained and, and ready to go and, and the pool's uh, looking great. It's heated, it's chlorinated and uh, we've, we're, we're happening. So that's been great. Um, another highlight uh, since, we, since we last met, we have opened our um, summer camp and swim lesson registration, um, which we opened on uh, a few weeks ago. Let's see my notes here on March uh, 14th and March 17th. And uh, registration um, has gone very well. It, we've, we had a lot of demand the last two years because our um, the number of spots that we were able to offer were so limited, but it seems like um, now that we've opened up to a more normal enrollment level, um, things have, have definitely returned to a, a pre-COVID uh, demand level, and it uh, was a very, very busy registration week. Um, our current enrollment, uh, we are mostly full. There are uh, a few spots in some of our camps. Um, this happens every time that we add a new age group or change things up. Um, people they, they hear from word of mouth or their previous experience with un, one of their older children that the, these are the camps that you sign up for for these age groups and they may not pay attention if we've tweaked something or added something new. And so some of the new camps uh, still have some space in them, but um, I imagine those will, those will be uh, filled up before the summer and we'll, uh, we continue to market those as well as our um, specialty enrichment camps that we offer throughout the summer. These are like the half day uh, Lego camps, babysitter camps, art camps, sports camps um, that people can take in uh, conjunction with our day camps. And um, we will be marketing those and, and those are, um, the enrollment's strong for those, but, but not uh, full by any means. And as well as our, our counselors in training and guards in training programs that, um, that are, uh, we'll be offering this summer for the middle school aged um, kids. And swim lessons have also been uh, really strong for enrollment. We're offering group lessons and private lessons again this summer. And uh, those are um, not completely full, but uh, the enrollment has been very strong. And I expect that we'll be we're pretty much filled up by the time summer rolls around. So we're really excited for um, the amount of interest in our programs for this summer. We have uh, a, just a huge number of new families uh, coming into our um, 
you know, interested in our camps in the pool. And so we're really excited for uh, just the level of interest people have in what we're offering. Uh, we'll continue to update uh, this board as, um, you know, as the season goes on and, and how things are doing with that. Uh, our next big special event will be our um, spring art show, which takes place on April 23rd, Saturday the 23rd. Um, this event is titled Through Artists' Eyes and will once again feature um, a huge number of some of Marin's most well-known and, and popular artists showing uh, new works for this art show. So we're really excited about that. Hope you guys can make it to that. Um, again, that's a Saturday, April 23rd and um, later, later this month. It's once again organized by a Marinwood veteran, Susan Press. So we're looking forward to another great art show for that. Um, on the park uh, maintenance side of things, um, one new development this last month was we had uh, the parking lot spruced up. We got um, all of the parking spaces restriped. We had the curbs repainted and the staff um, did a lot of um, re-landscaping around the parking lot, removing some old juniper and um, putting a lot of wood chip down and it looks, um, looks really good and we're really excited about that. Um, the pool is looking really good. We had some, some cracks repaired and some concrete replaced and um, we had uh, our depth markers were starting to starting to wear out and become trip hazards. So we had all of the, the old depth markers um, torn out and, and replaced with smooth tile that um, will not be a tripping hazard. And we also had our emergency uh, fire gate um, uh, repaired and needed to be repaired. So that was great. The Louise Court path in the Lucas Valley Estates, uh, we had some work done this last month to uh, limb up some, some overgrown trees, remove a bunch of dead brush from the creek bank and from the sides of the path and some poison oak was removed. And it's looking really clean and really nice and um, should be good for many years to come. So uh, we're excited about that. Uh, the upcoming projects the staff will be focusing on is um, besides what we already mentioned with uh, cleaning up and, and removing that uh, barbecue from the fireman's picnic area, we'll also be adding some plantings around the community center, uh, making some repairs to some of our storage sheds and doing a lot of work out at Creekside Park uh, to clean up the landscaping. So um, that's kind of what's in store with the, with the Parks and Rec. Please let me know if anyone has any questions about any of that. Awesome. Thank you, Luke. Uh, comments, questions from the board? I was just wondering if you were able, maybe moving forward, to take a look at the tennis courts and see if that's the normal wear and tear that we normally get after a year. And if not, maybe we can have the company come out and see. Um, oh, so um we don't have it in our budget to totally redo the whole court um and we are and we're doing it every other year resurfacing if it really as jason was saying is looking so bad like what 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 can the company like is there a warrant you know warranty or something i'm glad you brought that up sivan i wanted to i did uh, have a note to speak about the tennis courts and i failed to notice my notice i went through it so thank you for for asking that okay. um yeah a couple a couple notes just to to um Give more information about the the tennis courts so what we've been doing this this last several years is called a top coat and uh like i mentioned we do uh, our company that we bring out comes out and they fill in uh the cracks and they add some fortifications to the cracking um and we'll make repairs to any divots in the courts and then we'll add a new um a new coating over the top and, and repaint and this is only meant as a very temporary uh, solution to kind of keep the courts playable. Um, there's only so many of these top coats that are worth doing before um, they they are no longer uh, worthwhile. We need to do more of a, of a full resurfacing. Um, so we, we keep a set reassessing that and um, we will not continue to do top coats if we get beyond that. The, the courts that have been most recently uh, completed are, um, yeah, the cracks definitely show through um, and and that's not unexpected. Um, a lot of things contribute to that, including the weather is, is, is the, biggest, uh, the biggest factor. We have um, a lot of cold followed by hot days. We've got wet season followed by a lot of drought. Um, that does have a, it's a lot of wear and tear and can increase the cracking or can open up the cracks a lot. And that's not unexpected and it's not unusual. And that's something that we hear about upfront from the companies that perform this work for us. So, 
um, the courts are still playable and uh, they should last be before we have the next um, round of top coat planned. As far as we're not doing it every year and a half, it's more that the courts are on like a two to three year uh, cycle. We just do that, we alternate. So we're not doing all four courts at the same or all five courts at the same time. We do them on a cycle and, and kind of switch back and forth. So uh, I don't have the exact schedule right in front of me of when the next uh, work is planned, but um, we are keeping keeping tabs on that. And the top courts should be okay for a while. Yes, they are showing cracking, but they're definitely playable. And if we do see any major, um, major problems like a big divot or a crack that's that's going to be a tripping hazard we can also bring out someone to do a repair of that in the meantime before the next uh, work is planned so um the courts three and four the ones closest to the middle school are the ones that are next on our list to be addressed and um, we are looking at um, when we can try to um do a, a, a full resurfacing of those courts um that you know down the line and, and that's something that we are talking about and we'll um, you know, kind of update the board when, when we propose that. Um, does that. Does that answer your question? Yeah, and hopefully Jason's question that he had answered, asked you quite earlier. How much does it, just ballpark, does it cost or do you even know to resurface the courts? The full just resurfacing? Um, uh, it definitely varies. I don't, I'll have to, let me get back to you on that, Kathleen, on, on what the latest quote um, for that was, I don't have that right in front of me, but. Um, it's not I mean. cheap, if I remember correctly from the last time we went. No, that's why we haven't haven't done it in a long time, exactly. <laughs> but um, I'll be happy to get, get you. We have those four, plus we have the ones up in the Lucas Valley Estates. And I believe, do we touch the ones? No, the ones um, in Lucas Valley but so we don't touch those. Okay. But yeah, so we have what is we it? We have the one the one court at Creekside Park is ours. Um that's yeah. the only one besides the four courts um here at, at you know so we have um, we have five courts that we rotate through. Correct. I'm just I don't I didn't know if Kathleen knew about the one by Creekside. On, on Creekside <laughs> by Creekside Park, yeah. <laughs> Creekside Park on Creekside. The local, um, the local doesn't know about <laughs> No, I see your hand is is up. We have a oh. comment or question. Me? Yeah, you. Okay. Uh, I was just wondering when the pathways between the uh, streets are going to be cleaned up. Out of curiosity, the Do weeds you know, uh, are getting significantly high. Uh, do you have one in particular that you're that you that you have a question about? Well, I, Gab and I were walking by last Sunday. It, we went through from Opalstone to Peachstone, and the weeds on both sides are two feet at least, or higher. Oh um, yeah, it seems to be pretty much a long all the pathways that I've walked through down to the park and, and everything else. So I don't know about a lot of the other side ones, but I, I just don't know when they're going to get hit. Um, yeah, that's a good question. So I have been in touch with our landscape uh, contractor just in general, because the weeds are high pretty much everywhere you go. And, um, this is a time of year when they have to keep an eye on that and they have to end up stepping up their staffing and or adding days to the, the service week to kind of address that. And um, they, I know they are trying to get caught up right now on some of our common areas, some of the medians and some of the areas of Lucas Valley estates. Uh, as far as the walking paths, um, I'll, I'll continue to talk to them about that. But uh, yeah, I know they're behind and the weeds are tall um, pretty much everywhere you go, but uh, um, yeah, I appreciate bringing that up. Yeah, I'm just throwing it out there. Yeah, I appreciate it, Bill. Thanks. Thank you. Can I just ask a quick question about the pool? Um, the the cement work that was done is that cement going to gradually change colors? It seems like an odd color. It just doesn't like match at all. Now. You see me enough, Luke. I don't match my own clothes, so like 
I, I'm not asking it to be perfect, but it seems like an odd choice of color unless it's going to gradually change as it dries. Yeah, no, that's a good question, Chris. Yeah, um, I do expect the the concrete uh, patch work that was on the pool to to fade. The color we have out there the pink color around the deck is um you know was put in there you know several decades ago and uh it has faded to such a degree that it's not matchable it's right. not a normal color it wasn't a normal color to begin with it was a very custom thing and, um, and so when it came down to it uh and we're asked to uh get these things put in put in place they said okay so what how much do you are you going to want us to work on getting this color just just right and i said well do the best you can but we we got to open you know we, we got to get this thing opened up and got to get this done so um it's not going to be it's never going to be perfect. at some point right what's that the sun will bleach it at some point yeah yeah it'll it'll, fade, it'll light up, but it's it's gonna it'll be a it's gonna be two-tone you know for a while and and uh unfortunately not going to uh, match perfectly, but there are um, a few things we may be able to do down the line to, to make it match a little bit better. Um, and, but uh, yeah, for, for now, we're just happy to get the trip hazards yes. out of there and um, we'll, we'll see what we can do to, to color co coordinate a little bit better moving forward. I love that you brought that up because I noticed that today too, and said something to Savon while during the tadpoles. And I was like, why do they do it like that? And then you noticed it too. So. I'm there. I'm there a little bit each day. Um, that probably speaks to a larger, like uh, a larger question of, um, and, and Eric or, or Luke, I don't know who this would go to, even if you can begin to answer it. But uh, is there a planned, like, bond measure type of rotation? Uh, you know, we've never discussed that since I've been on the board. But I'm the, Eric's giving me the crinkled forehead. Um, I'm just thinking about like, you know, we're Fun talking about pool. tennis courts tonight. We're talking about like the the pool in my mind is has been outdated since probably right about the time I was born. Um, and I'm just wondering if there's obviously these are major major projects. If there's any any has there ever been a discussion prior to, you know, the new people on the board about you know, when in the future, maybe we would consider a, a, a new bond measure or something like that. You just got pool lights. It's not, not good enough. Well, my, my, uh, my, just... my crinkled forehead, Chris, to be clear, was in response to uh, a rotating bond measure because we don't have a bond measure to rotate in the first place. <laughs> so I was well, like, probably, I was a little lost. I guess, uh, yeah, yeah. I guess I'm thinking the, when, when I was on PNR a long time ago, ago that was the last time that we went out but at least in my mind that we went out for a bond um and um and so and i maybe i'm using the wrong terminology we went out and got a bunch of money that was voted on by the marinwood public um and i just didn't know as we start to look deep into our our crystal ball and, and where we want to move this community in the future um you know what you know, if there was, has ever been a discussion about that just prior to me being on the board, I, I'm guessing by that response, no. Uh, well, I, and I'll let Luke chime in, um, but there's certainly been discussions regarding uh, the long-term sustainability of the pool and what some of those would need uh, more around the lines of a, uh, you know, resurfacing and not what I'm, I think I'm hearing from you, which is a complete rebuild, um, which is an entire, entirely different ball of wax uh not even the the only thing in common with those two are that they involve a pool um but uh because a complete rebuild would be 10 times the cost of a resurface of the of the current pool and then obviously there's been some conversation around the top pool as well um but i'll let luke kind of follow up with some of that because he's done a lot more of the leg work on the condition of the shell and so on and so forth yeah no i think it's a good question chris and um it is, uh, you know, the pool has has been the pool f for for uh, since since it was originally built in the '60s, except for um, a, you know some changes to the location of the equipment room and the bathrooms and some updates to the to the pool to the building structure. But um, yeah, as far as uh, you know, that that would be something that would that would be a good discussion topic, you know, down the road for for the board um, about whether that's something that the community desires. Um, 
our, from, from a staffing perspective, we're looking at how can we get the most um, programming and meet the most needs of the community with, with the facility that we have. And so we're looking at, do we need to replace the shell? Can we patch it? Do we need to replace, uh, you know, giant sections of the deck or can we fill cracks and get, get by and, and save, save some money and keep things functional and safe? Um, the top pool is probably the one on, on my list that might need to be addressed sooner than later, just because of um, some of the erosion we've seen on, in the creek near that and some of the changes in the, um, the level of the deck and just seeing that that, that might just end up uh, needing a more and more repair. We might need to end up moving that away from, from that edge of the, um, of the creek and uh, move it back a little bit and do something different there. But as far as the whole pool co complex in general, I don't remember having, there hasn't been a big discussion about a full remodel or full rebuild and what that would look like. And, and that's just something that, um, you know, is kind of above what, what we're trying to do at the staffing level at this point. So. Well, I, long time ago, then I name him somebody from Blast in the Plast, Shane. I had talked to him when I was on the PNR about the pool. And we had had some conversations about, you know, doing a top pool kind of like what Tara Linda has, possibly doing like having like enlarging a little bit of what we currently have. But what would that mean with regulations for the uh, new regulations for the creek and like maybe having a separate lap pool that could be open? So I had talked to him, but never as a board or as the PNR, it was more like side conversations that I had with him. And I assumed that he had talked to you, Eric, about that too, but apparently not. Um, so I, I agree with you, Chris. I've always had it on my mind and I thought we had like a back thing. We all knew it was gonna happen. We just didn't know when we were gonna start really discussing it because we have the, the um, facilities building and then we have the parks and, um, possibly having to do more on the tennis courts and stuff before we get there because it's technically still functioning. No, I would respond and say that is a conversation we've had and what you're calling basically is a zero entry, which would be the newest code on the, on the top pool area. Um, you know, the one, you know, kind of bits of word of caution that I would uh, state too is these projects don't happen quickly. Um, you know, just permitting alone. Uh, if you look at everything, how long it's taken the Lucas Valley Homeowners Association, which is not a government agency and is not subject to nearly the level of, uh, of red tape that we are in, in projects of this size and nature. Um, you know, you'd be talking about shutting down the pool for a period of time, like uh, years, uh, not just a, a short little bit so you know in the top pool um and where it's situated and you know one of the issues with the lucas valley pool was certainly their proximity to the creek um and that was a big deal and we have a, uh, we're in the same situation so it, it's uh, uh certainly warrants extra conversation it certainly warrants uh, this conversation uh, but it, it also needs to be taken into the proper context of what the scope of this project would be. And I would certainly, if you, you know, are moving forward, even on the top pool, um, I would strongly recommend, in fact, I, you know, short of demanding that you're going to bring in a third party consultant uh, to work on this. Uh, this is not something that I would put on district staff, um, not because we can't figure it out, but because uh, these are experts in the field who do this and that's who you would want. Um, and that would be the only uh, responsible way to move forward with this uh, by all, you know, pretty much for any large public works process is now my new opinion after uh, every, you know, the four years that we've gone through on the yeah. maintenance facility, but especially when you're, you know, you're looking at pools is a much more complex building. Public pools are a much more complex process. And then of course you've got uh, all sorts of regulators and regulations due to the stream side uh, aspect of it and everything else. So this is something that would take, you know, years just to get you through into the permitting and then an extended period of time just on the building as well. I totally agree. Um, and I've been involved in some of that along the way. So I, I agree with you. And that's why I think maybe it's time to start 
the beginnings of that conversation because of how long it will take. Yeah, and I, I would agree with Luke. I, I would focus on the top pool because I think that's the area of the more pressing concern, just kind of given where it's located and uh, uh, what we're witnessing happening with some of the ground levels near it and so on and so forth. And then back with just like the fireman's picnic, this would be park and rec, correct? Um, well, uh, something of this scope, Kathleen. No, you're you're talking formal RFPs. You're talking, uh, you know, this isn't this isn't in, the start in, of the this conversation. Isn't, this isn't deciding to take out a barbecue, well, which, which is way too far into the weeds. You know, uh, this is a much larger public work process. True. Is is this something? I know you want to start the conversation, but. Do we have issues with our pool right now? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm like, I don't, we're, we're already late enough tonight, I think. Um, I'll, I'll address it when we ask for other, other items of interest. Okay. Uh, so just, uh, I'll speak just that the, the pool seems to be uh, running well as far okay. as we're concerned. That's what I thought. And, and things are going just, yeah, going okay down there. Okay, thanks. Um, anything from the public? Uh, yeah, one second. Uh, anything from the public? Stephen. Uh, yeah, one second. First of all, I'd like to commend Chris for his far reaching vision. I ag actually agree with him. I think we should be looking. Uh, to uh, building a new pool, building a new pool, much like the Terra Linda pool, um, and possibly putting in a splash pad in uh, the re for a replacement of the top pool. Um, those are the big conversations. Those are the big visions. Remember, we've got a 50-year-old pool. It's going to go sometime. And so um, starting a conversation is a good idea. With respect to um, the Park and Rec uh, report, as usual, um, Luke does a great job with the Recreation Department. I'm glad that things seem to be going well again. I'm also glad that the park staff is is emptying trash and, and mowing lawns and dog waste receptacles. But I, I want to go back to the firemen's picnic area because there's, I think, something that's gone missing here. First of all, with that big grill, um, that rotted through. There's two big holes. One's about nine inches in diameter, and the other one's seven inches in diameter. That didn't happen overnight. That was a, happened over a period of years. And what that shows is neglect. And that area has been neglected by the staff. And I don't know if it uh, if Luke demands that uh, these areas be on a maintenance schedule, but it certainly should have come up prior to it being a problem, P prior to me seeing someone trying to light a fire and noticing that the ashes were on the ground. And by the way, the ashes are on the ground. There may be a, a concrete pad underneath it, but when ha hot ashes are on the ground and the wind's blowing, that is a fire danger. With regards to the kids getting in there, smoking pot or doing whatever they're going to do, I don't quite frankly know how we get around that. Um, kids are going to be kids, and um, but that's our park. And um, lastly, um, uh, Eric made somewhat of a flippant remark. Well, we'll just remove the grill, and I. I Come on! I mean, you're 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 decommissioning the functionality of that park that has been neglected, and now that it's neglected, you want to get rid of stuff. Well, I want you to maintain it, and I, not only maintain it, I want you to improve it because this is the only park that we have, and the the maintenance guys shouldn't just be focused around the pool area. They need to be. Uh, looking at all of 800 you, acres Steven. that we own. This is your vision. This Can is our community. Comment? Thank you, Stephen. All right, Any other seeing comments? none, moving on to uh, board member items of interest, request for future agenda items. 
I'm not sure how to put it, but I think we should start having a big conversation. Um, we have the maintenance facility is going to be done relatively soon. And Eric, I totally agree with you. This would not be put on, on the staff. Um, this is a way bigger project than that maintenance facility. Um, the park replacement is going to happen. You know, I think we're uh, the, the PNR commission is going to start looking at ways to enhance our open space opportunities. And I'm, you know, I think it's the next step is what large projects are we invested in as a board um, that we want to look at? I like the resurfacing of the tennis courts to me is expensive and I'm, I'm definitely not opposed to it at all. But that's kind of one of those that like you find the money and you do it. Whereas like we're talking about like a total redo of a very old facility. It's totally running well right now, but um, I don't think you, you know, it's sort of like how many times are we going to resurface that deck before we decide, hey, look, we could do a lot better. So um, I guess what I'm asking for is to begin the conversation of, um, you know, our a, a new, you know, I don't, I don't even think it's just a pool facility because I think you're looking at the baby pool, the main pool, what else could we be offering there? Um, so it's a big question. And I'm only asking that we start thinking about it and have some baby conversations um, to consider what the possibilities are and what direction we might want to head as a board. Thanks, Chris. Any others? Yes, men was just an update on the tennis courts. And then possibly from Chief Wright when he finds out, as he said, the three miles in Marin Wood for Fiji. &E. All right. Very good. Okay. Then um, with that, I think we can adjourn. Got to go ask the Pope. To... <laughs> I didn't catch that one. What did you public. say, Bill? Public wants to chime in on it. Oh, it oh, okay. Go ahead. Oh, excuse me. Comments from the public. Stephen. Thanks, Stephen. <laughs> Any other public comment? Uh, nope, that is it. <laughs> All right. Motion to adjourn. Okay. So move. So move. Second. Second. <laughs> All right. Do we need to vote? No. All right. Awesome.